By the end of August, it was time to harvest the field of oats. Parts of this field were very dry, and with the exceptionally light rainfall during June and July, the crop of oats was not as heavy as Frank and his fellow club members would have liked. As we stated earlier, the growing of oats, or corn as we called it, used to be widespread in this country, used for food for people and as fodder for animals, especially horses and poultry. The oat straw was used for bedding cattle, and indeed could have been eaten by them when fodder was scarce, although the nutritional value of corn or barley straw is very small, unless grass seed has been sowed along with it. It is a well-known fact in years gone by that straw was used as a bedding for people, and another use of straw was for thatching houses. Oats flour is unsuitable for baking bread on its own, it would have had to be mixed with wheat or barley for that purpose. Crushed or rolled oats is nowadays served as porridge, considered to be very healthy eating, and oat flour or oatmeal can be made into oatmeal biscuits or cookies. The discovery of the healthy, cholesterol-lowering properties has led to the wider appreciation of oats as a good-for-you human food, possibly reducing the risk of heart disease. These days we hear a lot about farmer diversification, so perhaps there is a new market out there for some of the old crops of a hundred years ago. In days gone by, a popular use for the thrashed oats was for making illegal Irish whiskey. In America this would have been called moonshine, but here it was called we still, mountain dew or potching. We mentioned this to some of the Ballyronan club members, but surprisingly, none of them seem to know what we were talking about. Frank has the Super Major back in action again, this time linked to a mowing machine, which cut the corn and deposited it in neat bundles for the tyres coming behind. The man on the reaper is Kenny McGowan, and his job is to leave off the sheaves, all roughly the same size, so that the men lifting and tying would have the same amount of corn in each sheaf. These tires are using twine to tie the sheaves of corn. In days gone by they would have used seven or eight stalks of the corn for this purpose, but because of the shortness of some of this crop it would be difficult to make corn bands. In 1828 the Reverend Bell, a Presbyterian minister from Scotland, showed a reaping machine pushed by two horses which cut the corn and by means of a belt delivered it out to one side. The major drawback was that this machine made so much noise that it frightened the horses, and vibrated so much that it shook most of the oak grains onto the ground. Whatever the setbacks, the age of mechanised farming was here to stay, for it was becoming clear that these early machines, just as McCormick had predicted, could cut more corn in a day than eight or ten scythe men could have done. McCormick kept improving the reaper, or the mower, and by the 1860s it was selling in large numbers all over America. The chief improvement was that it now had two seats, one for the driver and one for the man laying it off. In those days the hand binding was done by the woman or older children. On the day of the harvesting, the filming was done by three of the club members, Martin and Gerard Devlin and Oliver Cassidy. In 1875, McCormick brought out a reaping machine with a reel and canvas elevator, which delivered the cut corn onto a platform, where two men tied the sheaves of corn and threw them onto the ground for stooking. While doing away with at least three men tying on the ground, this machine, including the driver and two tyres, was heavy to pull and required four horses. It is unlikely that this machine was ever used in this country, for just one year later in 1876 McCormick brought onto the market a device that was to change the face of farming forever. Believed to have been invented by a man called John Appleby, who in 1850 decided that he would invent a mechanism to tie sheaves. Twenty-five years later he patented a twine knotting device that was adopted by a number of leading builders, including McCormick. 
People travelled for miles to see the first machine, controlled by one man, which cut and bound the corn in a single operation. In the next eight years, the McCormick Harvester sold over 50,000 in America, and it was not long until they were in operation over here. The first binders tied the sheaves with wire, but farmers hesitated to use them, thinking that bits of the wire might get mixed with the grain and choke their animals. In 1881, the twine binder appeared, and there were only minor improvements over the next 80 years. By 1900, there were so many binders being built that the price of them fell to $120. Twenty years earlier, they cost three times that price. By the 1960s, the combined harvester had taken over the harvesting duties on the farms, and the binder, like so many other implements of yesteryear, was resigned to a proud place in Irish farming history.